walk this land with respect for all. Oh, what a life we could live. This is part of a much larger presentation, and um, we are framing um, the TPP in a larger um, fight that we're really all in, uh, where we the people and we the corporations um, are kind of engaged in a battle. Um, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement is only part of that. Um, and how we'll be talking today how the Trans-Pacific Partnership threatens our democracy and our very economic future. And we created this presentation with Mark McDermott. And those of you who have heard of Representative McDermott, yes, it is his brother. So the Fair Trade Coalition, um, as Chris said, is 66 labor, faith, environmental, social justice, um, student, co-ops, fair trade businesses. Witness for Peace uh, is a member. Um, and you'll be hearing more from them later. WACAN is a member of Washington Community Action Network. Um, so we work with a variety of different groups, all recognizing that our current global trading system is not benefiting workers or the environment in our country or in any of the countries in which we have our trading agreements. So I'm going to do a quick check-in with you all um, on our current economic health in our communities. So how many, we're just going to do hands up on this, um, how many of you or those close to you, so people in your family, people in your parish, your neighbors, have lost a job in the last five years? Put your hands up. Okay. Um, couldn't get or exhausted unemployment benefits? Hands up. Okay, about half the people. Lost or didn't have health insurance? Well, I see some more hands going up, maybe about two thirds. Um, difficult or worried about paying bills? Didn't know if you had enough, kind of prioritizing. Okay, again, the majority of people um, were forced into medical or other kinds of debt. Like you're holding some kind of debt, friends are holding debt, relatives. Okay, that's almost everybody. Um, facing large student loans. People you know, people you might be related to. Um, worried about adequate income in retirement or for some of us, being able to retire at all. Don't, don't know that you're ever going to retire. Okay, so that's almost the whole group. So, um, why, um, how are you feeling about these problems? What are some, what are some um, feelings, emotions that come to mind when you think about those issues around insurance and adequate resources? I'm going to shout them out. Oh, angry. angry, overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Fear. Fear. What else? Think about how bad it would be if you were overseas. Yeah, exactly. Maybe you're feeling a little bit lucky that you have maybe more than others do, but still not having enough. Mm -hmm. Other feelings? Yeah, most of them not really positive. A lot of concern. There's a lot of insecurity in our community around having enough to pay basic bills. And why do you think that the overwhelming majority of us are facing these challenges right now? Well, political. political. So maybe our political leaders aren't representing our interest. What else? Capitalism, imperialism, sorry, what was that? Corporations are taking all the money. Corporations are taking all the money. Beautiful segue into um, environmental damage. Yeah, this environmental damage is hurting all of us. Um, so in um, a recent Pal Par uh, Harris poll in June 2012, um, it was around the corporations. Um, people polled vast majority of them, major corporations have too much power, banks, financial institutions, and those that are bankrolling the lobbyists. Um, and it seems that we agree with them. Also, the majority of people, when asked, link corporate power to bad trade policies. So for example, um, this is a, po a poll that happened last year. And when asked about NAFTA, three-fourths of the folks that were uh, polled uh, across all political affiliations felt NAFTA had not been good for the U.S. economy or for U.S. workers. Similarly, um, and even more, this is a um, NBC Wall Street Journal poll, um, not actually the bastion of liberal polling. Um, again, across class, political party agreed that outsourcing of jobs um, to low-wage countries is potentially the biggest economic problem that we're facing, maybe even more important than um, budget deficits and the high cost of health care. 
Um, and we, when we say outsourcing, um, we're referring to the loss of living wage jobs here and the creation of poverty wage jobs in other places. It's not actually the loss of good jobs. So I am going to very quickly go through, um, throughout um, a period of history, the rise of corporate power and what has been the only antidote to the rise of corporate power, which has been the rise of people power. So um, 100, for 100 years after the US declared its independence, corporations were tightly controlled. It's important to remember there was a time when corporations were really tightly controlled. Um, and they existed for the public good. They existed for a short period of time to construct roads, to build canals. Um, when I was researching this, owners and, ma and managers were responsible for criminal acts committed on the job. And corporations were forbidden from in influencing political processes or attempting in any way to spend money to influence lawmaking. And the corporation was terminated if they exceeded their authority or they caused public harm. Could you imagine how many corporations would be terminated if that was still the situation? However, that started to change um, in the late 1800s, and, and this was um, you know, a president that actually understood that. It would be pretty amazing if President Obama was telling us he's very concerned about corporations becoming um, the having the power, becoming the masters over the people, and that the people were actually under the, um, what does he say, iron heel of the corporations. He says this because in that year, Corporations took their first stab at personhood, and they came very close to being granted it. And onward, they used the courts, they used um, the 14th Amendment, which was used to protect the rights of free slaves, to extend their rights. And what did we get? We got the rise of industrial capitalism, turn of the century, 1900s. Um, it, was, it was basically the Wild West in, in the factories where um, you know, tens of thousands of workers were dying every year, millions of children were being um, forced into the factories. Um, there was no minimum wage, minimum payments, minimum health and safety standards. Um, the AFL grew considerably from the 1800s to 1900s. The wobblies emerged um, for migrants um, and less skilled workers. And so it was not a very good time when corporations are dominating. Um, at this time, corporations also were um, encouraging trade policies um, when other forms of domination, military and otherwise, um, were being resisted. Trade agreements were a way, for example, the Philippines, that we, um, corporations were able to have preferential treatment. And you see how inequitable this trade agreement is, where the Philippines had to open up their shores to the exports with no tariffs from the U.S. However, we protected some of our products. And that continues today. Certain things are protected. So anyone who says we don't have a protectionist economic system, we have a free and open one, um, they're the ones that are being protected that are saying that. So what did that lead us to? Um, you know, the Great Depression. Um, you know, a high majority of people unemployed, underemployed. Um, you know, e economy, um, basically some of the darkest days of our economy, not just in the US, but to all, with all the economies that we are connected to. And in looking through the lessons of the Great Depression, um, they really mirror the lessons we're learning right now of the recession, that when banks are unregulated, when financial speculation is unchecked, when corporations get to write the rules, when there's growing inequality, when there's a weak safety net, the majority of people suffer, and it's not the corporations. However, what it did is it brought people together. It brought skilled and unskilled people together. It brought migrants and domestic workers together. They were camping out in, around um, governor's mansions and the White House, basically saying we, you need, there needs to be policies. And that's during the 1930s is where we got minimum wage, social security, unemployment insurance, many of the things we're fighting to protect right now. Um, and there was, it started to lay the groundwork for um, a, a more equitable playing field. Um, and we saw from the 1940s onward um, more even economic growth towards um, across different socioeconomic um, divides. We also, so going 1940s onward, um, felt that we had figured out some things and that we needed to export um, the model. 
And especially post-World War II, um, our government was feeling that we had a lot of answers and some of the um, uh, wealthy countries as well. And that's where we see the rise of these institutions. Um, you know, World Bank, it's interesting to think about their motto being a world um, free of poverty. Um, and that's not at all what we think about with the World Bank today, where they leave a wake of poverty um, behind every one of their policies. And they created this new global system going forward, 1940s to 1970s. And so there was sustained economic growth in the wealthy countries. As I mentioned, there was rising income, um, more income equality, not equally shared by women or communities of color, rapidly expanding trade during this time. Um, with wealthy countries benefiting um, at the expense of poor countries, utilizing their natural resources, utilizing their labor. And we began to see both growing resistance as well as increased dislocation in poor countries and um, beginning to see more of a rise of forced economic migration. So again, rise of people power um, in Guatemala, um, the Campesino Revolution, um, by the coffee and banana growers. Um, we see the independence in India led by the nonviolent um, Gandhian movement. We also see um, resistance to the wars um, here in the US, um, feeling that the US should not be involved militarily in other parts of the world. Also, to remember that um, it, the the corporations didn't give us these rights, whether it was women's rights, whether it was civil rights, um, they had to be demanded. And it took a long period of time, right? The, the bus boycott was over a year. Um, so it's just to remember that these movements um, had prolonged pressure, had prolonged hope, um, and that we need to remind ourselves of that and all of our struggles, that it's not gonna be one thing we do, it's not one event, it's not even maybe two events, and that everything we do builds to um, these important rights that we need to claim. Um, also consumer rights, recognizing um, that we don't want our rivers to be combusting. Um, and it was concerned communities that put the pressure on, and put all of these environmental laws on the books that are now at risk under Trans-Pacific Partnership. So you all probably have seen um, um, the charts I'm going to show you in different forms. Um, the takeaway from this, so this is 1947 to 1979, the takeaway from this is that the majority of people, their average income over that time period doubled, which means their, growing, their um, buying power doubled, they had more resources that they were putting back into the economy. And this is what enabled the economy to develop. People need resources to be putting things back in the economy and have a hope for growth. And actually, the folks that were making um, an average of $27,000, this is adjusted by, uh, to 2010 standards, so we could have some consistency with the next graph, um, saw their income growing the fastest. And again, it wasn't proportional. Um, people of color were still behind. Women, st still behind. They're behind then. They're still very behind. Um, however, this is we, building off of this is what we were looking um, to do going forward. But after 1979, um, 1980, ushered in um, Reagan, um, new set of policies, and this is what we have now. And I think many people in this room have only lived during this time period. Um, the bulk of my life was lived during this time period, um, and we see the poor losing their buying power, actually going in the opposite direction, and the rich amassing more and more wealth. So when we hear about this shared austerity, we know who is experiencing this austerity. And it is not, um, this is the 386% the, um, growth. These are the 11,000 richest families in the US that that represents. Um, and they're at a minimum income of $8.6 million a year. And, and where does that come from? Well, not hard, because while the corporations are saying we all need austerity, it is a golden era of corporate profits right now. Corporate profits are going through the roof, and they're and they very transparent about it. It is because they can depress labor, they can divide and conquer, they can have people fighting for jobs that they pay less and less for, and then who benefits? It's their shareholders that benefit. And so how this relates to trade policy is that this is not a game of chance. 
This isn't like, wow, the free market is just not going really well right now. It's because rules are being written and followed that benefit the very wealthy, that benefit the corporations. And our trade agreements are a fundamental package of that set of rules that benefits um, corporations globally. So if we had a chance, if we were at the table, based on your values, what rules would you write? What would you put into a trade agreement if you were at the table right now? Living wages for laborers. Living wages for laborers. Great. $22.50 an hour. Sorry? $22.50 an hour. $22.50 an hour. Wouldn't that be beautiful if the minimum wage was $22.50? That's great. Environmental protections. Environmental protections, yeah. I was going to say, too, we make trade deals only with countries that have real environmental protection, real workers' rights organized, starting with our own Exactly. Exactly. So clean, clean stuff up at home and then look to work with other governments, countries that are um, you know, respecting the inter inter uh, international labor organization standards, right? Collective bargaining, just basic things. It's 2013. Great. So keeping all of those things in mind, this little interactive piece. So what would you do? You just learned that there's an additive in your gasoline and it's getting into the drinking water of your family. And in scientific studies, this additive is linked to cancer. What would all of you, knowing you're all activists, what would you do? Sorry, sorry. Try to stop it. Stop. Get it out of the gasoline. Try to get it out of the gasoline. Okay, someone else said something? Or boycott the companies. These are great answers. Absolutely. You do something about it. You'd ban the additive, you'd boycott the country. Um, now, if that toxin is from a foreign mining company and, that, and then it's threatening the major watershed of your country, what would you do? It should be banned. You'd ban it. Yeah. You'd ban it. You'd kick that country out, that country. You'd kick that company out. You'd say, you're, putting, you're threatening the watershed of our people? Get out of our country. And what if that, and what if that concern is pollution in your water because of fracking? You'd ban fracking, exactly. And finally, what if this health concern was high fructose corn syrup? Don't buy it. Don't buy it. Mm-hmm. Could not. Education. Yep. You could ban it. Education. Maybe put a really high tariff on it, so it'd be really expensive. What if it was more expensive and something healthier? So that's all great, and that's what people around the world did do in um, in these cases. However. The corporations reacted. Um, so in California, they did. They banned the additive. Um, they banned MTBE, which was the additive in the gasoline. And Methanex, a Canadian company, sued them because it felt that they were um, impacting their ability to make profits and trade their, um, you know, their petrol. Similarly, a Canadian gold mining company. Um, decided to sue El Salvador. The watershed that was at risk was in El Salvador. And this gold mining company felt that El Salvador did not have the right to protect its watershed and sued them under CAFTA. Only Canada is not part of CAFTA. CAFTA is the Central American U.S. Trade Agreement. So they created a subsidiary in the U.S. so they could sue El Salvador. Lone Pines, the fracking question. Um, Quebec has just put a moratorium on fracking, which is pretty amazing. And they're trying to just do research to see if there has been any negative impact to the um, St. Lawrence River, which is um, where the fracking happened. And Lone Pine Resources, which is actually a Canadian-based company, sued Quebec, sued Canada for $250 million because they think they should be able to frack even if the community is worried about their water source. And we think this is actually the first time that a country, they created a subsidiary in Delaware, um, here in the US, and so they're technically suing them through their subsidiary, but they are a Canadian corporation. We think this is the first time they've used a tr trade agreement to sue their own country, to change a law they don't like. And the last one, Mexico just this year lost a lawsuit to Cargill, because um, they put a tariff on high fructose corn syrup, um, because of the health ramifications, also because they wanted to protect corn production in their own country. And this special tribunal that was created under NAFTA um, are right now compelling Mexico to pay Cargill $95 million.
So that is the impact of our trade agreements and the difference between what you would do and what the corporations are doing who are writing them. All right, pop quiz. This will create a million jobs in the first five years. There will be less immigration from Mexico. President Bill Clinton. What trade agreement is he talking about? NAFTA. NAFTA. And what really happened? Just the opposite. Just the opposite. What did the just the opposite look like? We lost five million jobs in Mexico. Exactly. We lost five million jobs. Mexicans migrated to the United States. Mexicans migrated to the United States. How many people know that we're 20 years into NAFTA? January is the 20th anniversary of NAFTA. Yeah, and we're celebrating by potentially passing another trade agreement. Um, and I can't really go into a room and say NAFTA and have anyone look me in the eye and say it was a good deal. Because um, as you all called out, um, and so this is 20 years under NAFTA. Um, some of this job loss, most of this job loss is due to NAFTA, but it's due to NAFTA and NAFTA style trade agreements because corporations were so excited about NAFTA, they tried to expand it and, and use it as a model for many trade agreements that came after. So huge loss of manufacturing jobs in the US. Um, manufacturing firms, just tens of thousands, this is a kind of a, a migration to Mexico. Um, and there were jobs that folks didn't even expect could be offshored, um, such as call centers and IT workers. Um, we talked, um, we have a members in our coalition, IT workers, and their parents made cars. And they said, well, we're not going to do that because we see car manufacturing offshoring. We're going to get involved in information technology and our jobs will be safe. Um, and then they are training their replacements and their shifts are getting cut and they don't get benefits. Um, also, the shrinking um, public coffers. So as corporations are going overseas, there's less people employed, there's less taxes. Corporations aren't paying the taxes, individuals aren't paying taxes, and so we're seeing huge state deficits here in Washington and, and, and all across the states, and we're having to pick between education and health care, um, and part of that is due to our trade agreements. Um, and then corporations, as we just saw, have used this to attack domestic laws that they don't like, um, whether those are environmental laws or labor laws. And then also, um, and I know many of you are working on this in, in your, uh, here, um, there was a flood of unsafe imported food. And this is not small family farms in Mexico sending us polluted food. This is big agribusiness and big corporations sending us their um, chemical-ridden food. And then we don't have a right to know about it because of the constraints on labeling. So while NAFTA was really bad here in the US and Canada, it was absolutely devastating in Mexico. Mexico actually changed its constitution to be a part of NAFTA. Um, it took out Article 27, which actually protected indigenous territories from sale or privatization so they could be used communally. And the Zapatistas refer to NAFTA as a death certificate for the Indian peoples of Mexico. Um, and they fought hard. We fought hard against NAFTA. They were arrested. People died actually trying to stop NAFTA in Mexico. And um, this is a, um, a sign in Zapatista territory. This is, you are in Zapatista rebel territory. Here the people command and the government obeys. And wouldn't that be a great territory to live under? Um, so yeah, um, our trade agreements, um, some of the root causes of economic instability, forced migration, lies at the feet of our trade agreements. Um, so farmers in Mexico lost their land, millions of them lost their livelihoods. They were forced into um, factory farms or in maquilladoras, or as, as we talk about it, in, in talking about the issue of comprehensive immigration reform, we're very much in support of it and enabling the people living here to have access to citizenship and the political process. And in talking about why people, if, if NAFTA really filled its purpose, promises and provided economic stability in Mexico and things were going okay in Mexico, why would people leave their communities, risk their lives to come into our country, come into our state, and then be treated with no dignity, being made, getting paid less than the minimum wage? If things were leaving their, their families behind, being so far away from their loved ones, um, you wouldn't choose to do that. It's a very desperate situation that causes people to do that. Um, and it's an important reminder. Also, it is important to remember who won in NAFTA. Because people say, well, if everyone, if everyone lost, well, why do we continue this policy? Um, and so when I was doing research for this, um, these companies actually pride themselves on, on um, developing the maquilladora sector. 
I always thought that was synonymous with sweatshops and that you would never ever take pride in creating these these factories that exploited mostly young women between the ages of 15 and 25 um, and also created created all sorts of, of violence, whether it's health violence in the factory or women risking their lives coming to and from the factory, and, and, and men too. But these are the corporations that benefited. Their profits um, skyrocketed. Some of them doubled in the first few years of NAFTA. So it's important to remember who were the winners. And they got greedy. They wanted to more NAFTAs. They wanted to expand the WTO. And who here was involved in the people's shutdown of the WTO in 1999 in Seattle? Anyone? Oh, nice. I see some hands up. I see someone who wishes they were a part of it. If only they were a little older, they could have been a part of it. Um, so again, congratulations to those of you who are a part of it. Um, that round has never been completed. And it was because of people here, it was because of people around the world who stood up and said, no, no more, not in our name. And similarly, the free trade area of the Americas, which was an expansion of NAFTA, went down. Um, and here's some you know, trade justice wins that we can feel proud about because they were hard fought. Um, so the multilateral agreement on investment was defeated in 1998. Um, CAFTA barely passed. It passed by two votes. And um, a number of our elected officials here in Washington State voted against it under huge duress. There was a lot of pressure. They didn't do it because they didn't think it was a good thing. They did it because um, it, there would have been political consequences if they did vote for it. And then while we would n never say the trade agreement with Peru, Colombia, Panama, or South Korea is a positive or a win, what it did show is that our government didn't, was worried about passing trade agreements with multiple other countries. And so they started creating these bilateral agreements that were much harder to organize on, and they were able to pass them through. So bringing us back up to the 21st century, um, 2013, in his State of the Union address, President Obama referenced workers and that to boost American jobs and level the playing field in the growing markets of Asia, our government intends to complete negotiations on which trade policy? Trans-Pacific Partnership. And my question for you is based on the evidence, 20 years of evidence we have with NAFTA, and other previous agreements. Do we believe him? No. no, we do not believe him. So that's why you're here tonight to find out about the TPP. How many people heard of the TPP before they came here tonight? Okay, keep your hand up if you feel you can talk about the TPP with your friends and neighbors. Awesome, awesome group, I like it. Our hope is that everyone will leave tonight feeling that they can talk with their friends and neighbors. And so I'm gonna share a lot of different pieces of information with you. And this is not you have to leave knowing all of this information. However, you might work on the environment. You might work on immigration reform. You might work on climate. You might um, um, be concerned because it might be your job that might be going overseas. So think about what, what meaning this has for you and connect what the TPP will do to your personal experience. So um, we played around a lot with TPP and toilet paper. Um, and that was where this action came from. This was actually an action at a round where activists went in in Dallas and changed out all the toilet paper and the stalls where the negotiations were happening. So the negotiators knew we have a very different definition of TPP. Um, we do not believe the partnership. Um, we think that's very much spin doctoring um, because this is not an even playing field. This is no partnership. So who is negotiating the TPP? 12 Pacific Rim countries. There they are. Um, and other countries can join on. Um, however, you look at the, the leaders, but I want you to look at the curtain behind the leaders, because this is who is actually negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership. There are 600 cleared corporate advisors, right? You name a big corporation, Walmart, Cargill, Monsanto. They are at the table. They have unlimited access to the text. Also, in the US Trade Representative's office, uh, um, Obama appointees, Michael Froman, head of the U.S. Trade Representative Office, comes from Citigroup. The former head of USTR came from Philip Morris. And the head of agricultural negotiations comes from Monsanto. And these are folks that are now in the Trade Representative's Office, and they will go back to those industries. Um, Ron Kurt, who was with Philip Morris, went left because, quote, he wanted to make money. And he wasn't making money working with USTR. 
So they go fluidly between USTR, they're negotiating. Um, so the companies have negotiators inside our government as well as, um, represent, uh, as, well as representing their own corporation at the table. As I mentioned, different from other trade agreements, the TPP has a docking clause, which means other countries can join on. Um, Japan just joined on this year. Uh, Mexico and Canada joined on at the end of last year. Korea is talking about joining on, South Korea. And um, Thailand and Taiwan and uh, Philippines are also talking about joining on. So let's debunk some of the myths here, right? So going back to President Obama's statement, this will expand exports, creating jobs. Okay, here are the facts. We already have trade agreements with six of these countries, right? So our tariffs are already very low or zero with six of these countries already. The other five countries, Malaysia, Vietnam, don't have a lot of buying power, right? If, you, if you're making $1,300 a year, you're not gonna be buying our cars. You're not gonna be buying a lot of the things that we make. If you are in Brunei or New Zealand, you have more buying power, but they're not a lot of people. Right? There's less than half a million people in Brunei. We've got more people in Seattle than Brunei has in its country. Um, and then if you look at Japan, Japan has a lot of people, good buying power. However, our trade deficit with Japan is huge, $76 billion. And what we found is that trade deficits only go up after we have a trade agreement. We've seen it with South Korea. And so we're just not buying this rationale. So what are our trade agreements really about? Well, as we've been discussing, it is about fundamentally dismantling our democracy here as well as abroad. It's about this secret rulemaking, creating these secret tribunals with their in investor state chapter. It's also about overturning our domestic laws outside of our courts. So we don't have access to these tribunals. It's also about corporations um, institutionalizing their hard-fought gains since the 1800s. And I very much see it as um, a privatization of our public policy, because the public policy deserves to have the input of members of Congress, of the people. Otherwise, it's a corporate policy. It's really a private policy. And so this is what our trade agreements are really about. So reflecting on what you value, the things that you've shared you value most, Unfortunately, the Trans-Pacific Partnership flies in the face of all of that, and we've talked about many of these things already, right? Growing, growing income inequality. Banks are using it as a way to deregulate, especially countries that have high regulations because they're concerned about re recessions, especially throughout Asia. Um, it's also turning, continuing to turn our natural resources into profits, hiding consumers' right to know. We're very concerned about um, you know, 522, hard-fought win for GMO labeling, fingers crossed this year. Could that be something that would be challenged? We've seen a challenge to dolphin-safe tuna labels um, that were also hard-fought and um, had to be uh, taken away because of a, um, a lawsuit. We've also, um, pharmaceutical companies are at the table and they are trying to extend patents so that people in countries where they are only making a couple dollars a day are not gonna have access to life-saving medicines, um, particularly in Vietnam and Malaysia. And just a couple of days ago, there was yet another fire in Bangladesh that claimed the lives of garment workers. And this continues to happen. Um, already this year, um, close to 1,500 workers in Bangladesh, just in the garment sector, have lost their lives. Um, not to mention internet censorship. Um, this is a way of reviving SOPA um, the Stop Online Piracy Act, which we know was an uh, attempt to censor the internet, people's access to material on the internet, um, and as we mentioned, economic um, forced migration and eroding of the tax base. In addition to this trade agreement, Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, what the negotiators have asked for is fast track. How many people here have heard of fast track or know what fast track is? Yeah, so we had it under NAFTA, we had it under the WTO, and what this means is that Congress gives up their constitutional authority, obligation to regulate foreign commerce, and gives it entirely to the executive branch. And we've only elected one person into office, and he's appointed a whole bunch of people who we don't really think represents us. And so when this trade agreement goes in front of Congress, they will only be able to vote yes or no. They will not be able to amend it in any way. And this is supposed to be the people's branch, the, the branch of government where our voices are heard, and we have some amount of influence. So we'll talk a little bit more about that and how we can influence that process. 
So I want to talk about some of the activism around the um, TPP, and I'm going to go through these a little quickly. There have been multiple rounds. As I mentioned, um, there have been four years of TPP negotiations, 19 rounds of negotiation. Um, so there were um, events in Chicago a couple years ago with Jesse Jackson and Ben and Jerry's. Um, there was also um, events in San Diego. This is with Buy-In USA, a Philippine solidarity organization. We've worked very closely with the Occupy movement. They've been out in front of this. Um, there were direct actions during the Leesburg round. This woman um, wouldn't leave and wouldn't let negotiators in. And she got a ton of press, which was great. Um, there was just a recent takeover of U.S. Trade Representative's building. Um, folks dressed up as construction workers, um, and Backbone Campaign was involved in this as a member of the Fair Trade Coalition, um, and dropped a huge banner um, reminiscent of the WTO protests, which is really exciting. Also, there have been, in almost every TPP country, there has been resistance. Um, these are Malaysian HIV AIDS activists, and these are Japanese farmers. Um, and Japanese, in Japan, a small rally is 6,000 people. They get people out, and they get people out and mad. And the farmers are really upset because they have very important crops that are incredibly protected. They also have a great health system in Japan, um, as well as in New Zealand, Australia, and more or less in Canada as well. We here in Washington had a big event on December 1st because those of you might remember that candidate Obama and candidate Clinton in 2008 fell over themselves talking about how NAFTA had to be renegotiated, it wasn't helping workers. So when Canada and Mexico joined the TPP, we felt we had to draw attention to this. So we had a big event up at the Peace Arch, and yes, that is a giant ass. Free trade my ass was um, the message. And these were um, Mexican, US, and um, Canadian activists. So we reinvigorated NAFTA resistors. Um, it was a very fun event. Um, we basically had a huge strategizing session and got geared up for what next. And we took action. We had an incredible pinata that we broke. And when we smashed the TPP one very cathartic day, out of it came um, GMO-free popcorn and medicine vials that were access to generic medicines um, that were really labor-made jelly beans, um, which was great. Um, we followed it up with a series of actions, um, including Twitter storms, um, big presence on Facebook, listservs. Um, we actually had a webinar with Peruvian activists during the Peru round, and down there they're talking about this as a disintegration policy. So all of the strides that countries and activists throughout Peru have made um, in working together um, for similar economic gains, they feel will be eroded because Peru and, and Chile are part of this, but the other countries are not. So it's being used as a way to divide up South America yet again. We've also called out bad local players, so Zymogenics, um, and there's some people in this room that are pictured in this picture. I think they recognize themselves. Um, Zymogenics is a member of Big Pharma. We took pictures saying that they do not represent us, and this went to negotiators during the round in San Diego. Also, Amy Truax, Witness for Peace, is responsible for this lovely piece. Um, this was an action we did. We took a bunch of pictures with signs. We created, this is what we stand for, and we presented it to USTR's Dimitri Morantis, Deputy Director, when he was in Seattle. And he seems to agree with us, right? At least when he's in Seattle, he's all on board. So those were some of the creative actions that we have done. We've also worked with some of our members of Congress. Some of them are more movable than others. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we have gotten um, Representative Smith and Larson and McDermott to, to say something about the lack of authentic stakeholder involvement and transparency. Um, Representative McDermott has just recently signed on to a letter against Fast Track, which is huge. It's very um, heartening. Now he needs to be a leader in the state. Public health groups have signed on, and so have um, many Washingtonians um, voiced their concern. We've had day actions. This was um, on I-5 um, during rush hour near Olympia. We've had evening actions. This is with the TPP exporter when there was a secret meeting in Vancouver that we found about, out about, and we went and we kind of blew the whistle on that, working with the Canadian media. So where are we right now? Um, President Obama stated that he wanted to finish this by the end of this year. Um, while we are not at all in favor of our current government shutdown, we think it's ridiculous, there is one 
very thin silver lining, and that is that President Obama did not go to APEC. And that was a meeting recently in Indonesia where they were going to um, uh, smooth out all the questions with the TPP. So we feel that TPP is not going to go forward this year, which gives us time to organize. Because the more people know about it, the more people will resist it. Fast track, unfortunately, will probably come up this year, and that's something that we need to strategize on, and we will. So in conclusion, we need to remember we are on the shoulders of history. I take great inspiration from this picture. This is 20,000 garment workers, the majority of them migrants and women that did not have access to the political process in 1909. And they went on strike for three months to get basic health and safety minimum wage standards in their factories. And they were able to organize many factories. And one of the ones they were not able to organize was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. We all know what happened there. Within months, that factory burned to the ground and hundreds of people died. And unfortunately, we're seeing a similar situation right now in Bangladesh. And so we need to act locally and connect globally. So here's our opportunity tonight, and we're going to be spending more time going through this. But we have lots of opportunities, and I want to be hearing from all of you all, because there's not one size fits all. This is an opportunity to talk about what you all are already engaged in right now and how you can connect. Um, whether that's letters to the editor, whether that's putting pressure on your congressional delegation, linking up with different activists. There's TPP Tuesdays I'm happy to talk with you more about. You are also most welcome to become a member or a supporter of the Washington Fair Trade Coalition, and we'll give you some other ways that you can do that. Um, however, we want you to get your creative juices flowing, because um, it was when it flows from your passion, your activism, your caring, that you are able to um, move people. And again, when people know, they will act. And so here's a series of um, different resources. And again, I will send out this PowerPoint presentation to anyone that wants to know. Um, and we would like to acknowledge the many people that have contributed to this. We have compiled the work of many trade justice um, activists all over the world. Um, and we very much stand with them today. And I am going to invite up um, our activist friend from Colombia. Um, John Iro Castro, um, I'm hoping I'm saying his name anywhere close to correct, um, and his interpreter, um, who will be sharing his personal story of what it is like living on the other side of a U.S. trade agreement. We have a U.S. trade agreement with Colombia that has been in, in place for the last two years. And so he's going to be able to tell you um, his personal experience. And so we're very fortunate to have him. So I welcome him to come up now. Muy uh, buenas noches. Agradecerle a usted el brindar su atención y, y en este espacio escuchar algunas inquietudes y problemáticas resumidas que se le, se le va a dar a conocer. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for your attention um, and for coming here to hear about um, some of the problems and the challenges that we're facing in Colombia, or at least a, a brief overview of some of those issues. Mi nombre es John Jairo Castro Balanta. Eh, de igual manera, Quiero resaltar el, el nombre de la ONG Acción Permanente por la Paz, que gracias a, a la lucha y al interés que ellos han tenido de, de que haya este cruce de información, eh, hago presencia en este lugar. Uh, my name is John Jairo Castro Balanta, um, and I also just want to highlight uh, the organization Witness for Peace, um, who's organized and accompanied this tour, and is um, who's what's allowing me to, to be here tonight and make these sorts of connections and shared spaces with all of you. Quiero felicitar a la compañera por tan buena exposición que, que hizo. Eh, por un momento me sentí como en Colombia, pero no tanto con la parte alegre que tenemos allá sino con la parte de, de la problemática social que nos han dejado los tratados de, de libre comercio. Um, I just want to congratulate Kristen on such a such a great presentation. For a minute there, I actually felt like I was in Colombia, and unfortunately, um, not so much because of the of the joy um, that we have there, but actually because so many of the problems that we're facing are so similar. Comentarle que nosotros de, especialmente Empezamos siendo víctimas eh, con estos tratados, con estos tratados que los gobiernos eh, tanto de Colombia como de los, de los Estados Unidos y de distintos países que Colombia ha firmado 
eh, tratados de libre comercio, lo que han hecho es saqueo de, de nuestros recursos naturales y desplazamiento eh, de nuestras comunidades. We are the victims of these free trade policies um, that governments, whether they're the Colombian government, the United States government, um, or governments of other countries, are signing um, because they are robbing us of our natural resources and displacing our populations. Yo vengo de una ciudad conocida como Buenaventura, es del departamento del Valle. Somos un, un potencial de 600 mil habitantes y el 90% de esa comunidad somos afro. I come from a city called Buenaventura in the Valle del Cauca province of Colombia. Um, we have about 600,000 um, residents and 90% of the population of Buenaventura is Afro-Colombian. Más que ningún otro sector de, la, de nuestro país, hemos sentido implacablemente cómo los efectos negativos, los impactos negativos de estos tratados han ido acabando con, con nuestra comunidad. Se ha aumentado el índice de desempleo, eh, ha aumentado eh, la intermediación a través de estas empresas de, de, de servicios temporales, cervezas intermediarias. Eh, cayó en manos de, de la privatización los, los recursos del gobierno, los recursos del Estado y servicios del Estado también. Um, and our city, perhaps more than any other, has really felt the negative impacts of the of free trade agreements um, and generally with of privatization. And um, we've seen how they are actually destroying um, and trying to do away entirely with our communities. And um, we've seen rising rates of unemployment, of indirect contracting um, through a number of different strategies and all the labor exploitation that that entails. Um, much higher rates of poverty um, and all of this, and also. Um, along with privatization of state services um, and what were previously uh, public goods. Quiero decirle que en Colombia no se oye tanto, o mejor dicho, la verdad yo nunca llegué a escuchar sobre el, el, tratado, de, el tratado de Transpacífico, como ustedes lo conocen como TPP. Eh, nuestro presidente responsablemente nos embarcó ahora en un tema de una alianza conocida como Alianza del Pacífico, pero ya hoy en día he ido entendiendo poco a poco hacia dónde nos va llevando este gobierno despiadado que nosotros tenemos en cabeza de Juan Manuel Santo. Um, you know, actually, Colombia, we don't, we, there isn't a lot of awareness or knowledge about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP as it's known here. Um, our president, Juan Manuel Santos, actually just uh, entered into negotiations with another free trade agreement in Colombia, the Pacific Alliance, um, and this has given us an idea of where our country is headed in the hands of this criminal government of Juan Manuel, Juan Manuel Santos. Muy buenas, mi nombre es John Jairo Castro Valanta. Soy presidente de, del Sindicato Unión Portuaria Capítulo Buenaventura. Es una organización sindical en la cual se encuentra eh, a nivel nacional en nuestro país, eh, que es Colombia. Eh, tenemos capítulo en Barranquilla, Santa Marta y Cartagena. Lo principal de hoy que quiero tocarles es cómo a nosotros nos ha afectado en Colombia los acuerdos internacionales conocidos como tratados de libre comercio, que han sido tratados que han ido so socavando la, la riqueza de, de, de nuestro país, y de igual manera de distintos países, eh, son tratados que el gobierno firma, donde únicamente el, el Congreso presenta y aprueba el acuerdo marco, pero no se tiene conocimiento de aquellos acuerdos que firma, que a los que llegan, bien sean los ministros o, el, o los mismos presidentes a espalda de, de la comunidad. Hoy en día, Buenaventura es una ciudad que es la... Eh, representa la máxima actividad portuaria en, en Colombia, con una movilidad de carga del, del 65% en eh, nuestro país. Y de igual manera también se encuentra sumergida en la pobreza y en la miseria, ya que estos tratados lo que han dejado han sido temas de destierro, temas de desplazamiento, de asesinato y de explotación laboral. Vivimos una, unas condiciones paupérrimas. Ha entrado el tema de la privatización, 
Con ello ha entrado el tema de la tercerización laboral, son las empresas intermediarias las, las que se enriquecen, esclavizando cada día más a los trabajadores y a nuestra comunidad. De igual manera, ahora nos embarcamos en, en otro tratado que es conocido como Alianza Pacífico. Es un tratado de cuatro países como es México, eh, Perú, Chile y Colombia. Con este Tratado de Alianza Pacífico son objetivos claros de las políticas del gobierno eh, estadounidense aplicando las políticas neoliberal para continuar esclavizándonos con las empresas eh, intermediarias a través de las multinacionales. Vemos de que hoy en día el corredor de la cuenca del Pacífico se ha hecho un, un corredor de suma importancia ya que Estados Unidos se estaba quedando atrás de la economía del desarrollo económico y se estaba encabezando en los países, en algunos países de, del Asia. Es por eso que hoy desde aquí nosotros como colombianos y ciudadanos y trabajadores hacemos un, una voz de alerta, damos una voz de, de unidad para que en conjunto con, con esta nación, con, en conjunto con, el, con los ciudadanos de este país, hagamos resistencia tanto al Tratado, a la Alianza Pacífico, como al Tratado Transpacífico que va violando todo tema de derecho y que lo que tenemos como conocimiento son tratados que se firmarán no con acuerdos de los gobiernos eh, de las distintas naciones, sino que son acuerdos que firmarán los empresarios para condicionar y que los países subdesarrollados que hagan parte de... de de, esa, de ese tratado sean sometidos bajo las condiciones de ellos. Nosotros no queremos seguir viviendo bajo las condiciones de que hoy en nuestra ciudad se eleva el índice de, de asesinato. Es una de las ciudades más violentas del, del departamento del Valle. Es una de las ciudades más pobres de, de Colombia. Y de igual manera padecemos también el problema de la discriminación. El señor Juan Manuel Santo como vergüenza que sintió de la firma de la Alianza Pacífico, no vio otra ciudad que presentar más que la ciudad de Cali, porque él sabía que, le, que Buenaventura como puerto no era, no era digno de mostrar por el, el desarrollo que a espaldas nos ha dejado. De todas formas, con esto, yo lo que quiero es llamar al tema de la unidad, al tema de la conciencia y al tema del rechazo, de esta esclavización neoliberal que se ha venido aplicando en los distintos continentes. Gracias. I hope you'll join in on this last song. You know, when it comes down to it, we're all in this together. The chorus goes. One lion, one heart, we're all in this together. One lion, one heart, One green planet forever. I'm a woman, I'm a man, I'm a child of the land. My roots tap to this earth, no matter where I stand. I'm a rich one, I'm a poor one, I'm the orphan locked outside. I'm the family that you'll always have, walking at your side. I'm a beggar. I'm a thief, I'm one who still believes. I'm the farmer kicking dust, but still I'm planting seeds. I'm the promise, I'm the lie, I'm the glint that lights your eye. I'm the spirit and the wind, and the fire that never dies. Let me hear you now. One land, one heart, we're all in this together. One land, one heart. One green planet forever. One land, one heart. We're all in this together. One land, one heart. One green planet forever. A 
on the old, on the young, on the song that's seldom sung, on the student and the teacher, on the mother's native tongue, on the sparrow's piercing note, the arms within your coat, on the spark within the darkness that lights a flame of hope. One land, one heart, we're all in this together. One land, one heart, one green planet forever. On the river, on the mountain, on the weathered twisted tree, on the fire and the flood, on the heartbeat of the sea. One land, one heart, we're all in this together. One land, one heart, one green planet forever. I am black, I am white, I'm the dove that's taken flight. I'm the healer and the patient. I'm a soldier by all rights. I'm a prisoner, I am free. I'm bound in unity. I'm a patriot of Earth. I'm dreaming harmony. One land, one heart. We're all in this together. One land, one heart. One green planet forever. Let me hear you singing now. One land, one heart. We're all in this together. One land, one heart. One green planet forever. Now this time around, sing it like you mean it. Sing it for yourselves, of course, but... Sing it for the children, too. Sing it for your community. Sing it for this old planet. Here we go. One land, one heart. We're all in this together. One land, one heart. One green planet forever. One green planet forever. One green planet forever. If we could walk this land with respect for all, oh, what a life 